you very much for turning up for tonight's uh, talk on Sunday night. Uh, it's very important and it's great to see so many people here in the room. Um, my name is Jack Ryan. I'm the Vice Provost of the College and Dean of Arts and Humanities. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping and then uh, we'll get to introductions. So just a reminder, these are just some pieces from the Gettysburg College mission statement. The college believes in the power of a liberal arts education to help students develop critical thinking skills, broad vision, and effective communication. We further believe in the free and open exchange of ideas, the worth and dignity of all people, and the limitless value of their intellectual potential, civil discourse, and a strong commitment to a diverse and inclusive learning environment. We have one clear and very basic expectation for this evening's event, and that is an expectation that we will all engage in civil discourse and conduct. Disrupting the beat speaker or shouting him down is not something that will be tolerated. Any conduct that jeopardizes the safety of our audience or violates college policy or law will additionally not be tolerated. Thank you for coming out tonight again. Now I'm going to introduce my colleague from Religious Studies, Megan Sijapati, who will introduce tonight's speaker. by Fortress Press, and the book Responding to Secularization, published in 2011 by Brill. He's also the author of a number of academic articles on Muslims in Europe and religion and secularization. His views on Islamophobia have been cited by organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Center for American Progress, and the Southern Poverty Law Center. I first became aware of Todd Green's work when I heard him talk about his book, The Fear of Islam, in an interview in New Books in Islamic Studies. I was impressed by the depth and clarity of his presentation of this exceedingly complex and vexing topic. But more importantly, I was struck by how his work provided a vocabulary for what many of us in the field of religious studies, religion and violence, and Islamic studies have been witnessing for years in the US, but have not necessarily had the right language or the data for addressing beyond our scholarly audiences. To this end, Dr. Green's work is an example of the critical role that the academic study of religion plays in the contemporary world. Whether at the local level or the global level, as a scholar of religion, I believe we must endeavor to understand the problems of injustice and violence, particularly as they relate to religion, in responsible ways. Critical analysis, careful study, proper use of evidence, and constant attention to context are key to this endeavor. So I want to personally thank Todd Green for being a great, uh, very helpful, wonderful, tremendous conversation partner and resource over the past month of, as we have discussed these issues. I also want to thank you for your willingness to come to Gettysburg College on such short notice. I also would like to thank President Riggs, Provost Sappy, and Dean Ramsey, among others, for their unwavering commitment to the outset to holding tonight's lecture. This is not an easy situation for any institution of higher learning at this moment in America. And we must recognize that we are fortunate here at Gettysburg College. Oh, wait. Hold on. <laughs> what does it mean to recognize? This is not an easy situation. And even for those of us who had hoped that we wouldn't be in this situation this week, we must recognize that we are fortunate here at Gettysburg College to have the administrative commitment to making tonight's event happen. So on behalf of Gettysburg College, the Department of Religious Studies, and the Peace and Justice Studies program, I welcome Professor Todd Green.
I've only been in town a few hours, but this is a beautiful town, a beautiful campus, and I have experienced nothing but hospitality, so I want to thank this community for that and for this, this opportunity, what I really consider a platform to be able to come and speak, and, which is an honor and it's a privilege uh, for me to be able to be here to speak with you tonight. Islamophobia presents us at this moment in our nation's history with one of the greatest moral dilemmas of our time. It doesn't matter how you measure it, if it's by the rise in anti-Muslim hate crimes, the rise in opposition to the building of mosques, or the establishment of Muslim cemeteries, or law enforcement uh, surveillance at times, which has been controversial, whether we're talking about Muslim bans. The list can go on and on. Uh, in my opinion, from my perspective of what I study and what I do, right now our nation is awash in a sea of Islamophobia. And right now, there is a political establishment in this nation that has trafficked in anti-Muslim conspiracy theories and instrumentalized Islamophobia for, for political gain. Which leads me to conclude that the moral compass of our nation right now is broken. And we've got a lot of work to do. As such, I think it's important to recognize that there are two great moral <coughs> questions that stand before those of us who are in the majority population, those of us who are not Muslim in other words, which in the United States is 99% of the population. <coughs> We're the ones who really have to wrestle through two important questions. The first, what are our commitments to our Muslim neighbors? In the case of Gettysburg College, what are our commitments to our Muslim students, staff, and faculty members? What do we owe them? All right. Uh, how do we be good neighbors to our Muslim students in a time like this? That is a moral question. I know there's a lot of talk right now about freedom of speech, and it's a fair conversation to have. It is not the only topic that is worth addressing. These moral questions are equally as important. What are our commitments to our Muslim neighbors? And how do we tell truths about our Muslim neighbors? Assuming that we still live in a nation in which not bearing false witness against people it is still a value. How do we not bear false witness against Muslims? How do we tell truths about them? That's actually a much harder question than it may seem like. But these are the two questions that we should not let go of. It should not escape us either this week in a very difficult time in this campus. This is history I recognize, but frankly, in the long term as well. So these questions will be there here tonight as they're sort of the horizon upon which I view this entire topic. I mean, I'll be focusing very particularly on a, on a specific component within Islamophobia, but I am thinking through these questions the whole time, and I hope you do as well. I want to be talking about something called, I call, professional Islamophobia, but I want to begin at least by defining what Islamophobia is, at least how I define it, what my working definition is tonight. Islamophobia is the irrational fear, hostility, and hatred of Muslims and Islam. It's also the exclusionary and discriminatory practices that arise from that fear and hatred. So it's about attitudes and it's also about actions. That second piece is very important. Sometimes the majority of populations can think of prejudice as just negative opinions. I'm not just talking about negative opinions. Those opinions, those feelings, that fear I'm talking about can and often does get translated into action and sometimes into policies that affect the lives and the livelihoods, in this case, of Muslims, or those perceived to be Muslim. Islamophobia is actually a very complicated phenomenon, and it's not only Muslims who are uh, the target of this in many cases. So that's the working definition that we're going to have for this evening. Now, what is professional Islamophobia? Well, you're about to get baptized in that this week here at uh, Gettysburg College. But let me give my two cents for it, which is all it is, one person's perspective. Professional Islamophobia refers really to this network, a very intricate network, a cadre of extremist bloggers, authors, some politicians, pundits, uh, who make a living and a career off of dehumanizing and demonizing Muslims. These are people who will wake up tomorrow morning and they'll try to figure out how better to dehumanize and demonize Muslims today than yesterday. And this is their career. This is not a side job. This is not an extracurricular activity. 
This is not something they get around to doing after they've done a full week's of work somewhere else or finish their shift at Starbucks. I don't know. This is their job. And as I will note later, it is in many cases a very lucrative job. There is a lot of money involved in this industry. There's a lot to be gained from it. Personal, financial, and professional. So that's broadly speaking what I'm talking about when I'm talking about professional Islamophobia, what others call the Islamophobia industry. Okay? Now, who are its main proponents? I wish I had a lot more time than I do tonight because there's a lot of people I can talk about. There's a lot of organizations I can talk about and trying to map out how they're connected in very intricate ways. But I don't have that much time and I want to make sure we have time for a conversation. So I'm going to boil it down to the three biggest players in the professional Islamophobia industry or network. Though I will, in the course of my lecture tonight, make reference to some, uh, some other figures in this network and even to some politicians that have been heavily influenced by it. But the three are there. You might recognize one, but, uh, but actually they kind of go together in many ways. They, they, they can operate independently, but they also collaborate quite a few bit, particularly numbers one and two. We'll talk about them in a moment. Uh, but Pamela Geller, Robert Spencer, Frank Gaffney, among many others. But I think, in my opinion, if I had to sort of, sort of summarize this in terms of three people who have the most influence right now in this industry, uh, and who have the most to gain in terms of dehumanizing Muslims, or political gain particularly, these are the three. And they are not to be underestimated. No matter what my personal opinion is of these figures, um, I try hard not to underestimate them. These are, these are very powerful, and they can be very persuasive figures if you know very little about Islam or Muslim communities. Uh, let me just do quick bios on each of these. I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on the bio part, but Pamela Geller, um, in fact, most of what I'm about to say about Pamela Geller is going to apply to Robert Spencer because they are sort of the, the dynamic duo of the Islamophobia industry, and they partner and collaborate quite a bit. Uh, Pamela Geller has been blogging and mostly in the, uh, against Muslims and Islam since after 9-11. She was not particularly politically active before 9-11. So a lot of this came along after 9-11. She blogged for a long time for a site called Atlas Shrugs, which transitioned into PamelaGeller.com. She's the co-founder, initially the co-founder of an organization called Stop Islamization of America, patterned on a comparable group in Europe. That has somewhat morphed into an organization called the American Freedom Defense Initiative, AFDI. So she is the co-founder of that. You can take a wild guess who the other founder is. Uh, he's coming to your campus on Wednesday. She came to public, you know, really widespread public prominence around 2010 in the debate in the United States over a proposed Islamic center in Lower Manhattan uh, oftentimes deemed by the media as the Ground Zero Mosque. And this was in May, into June, and all through the summer of 2010. And it was Geller and it was Spencer particularly, as bloggers and authors and, and sort of anti-Muslim activists, who are largely, not solely, but largely responsible for this becoming such a national public issue. There was a, a, a developer in a Muslim organization that had been proposing this Islamic center some blocks uh, from uh, Ground Zero in the site of an old Burlington Coke factory. And they went through all the proper channels, they went through all the, um, the zoning rituals that you have to go through to build anything in America, and, and particularly in New York City. So they did everything by the book. Uh, but Geller and Spencer did a good job of taking this into the national spotlight and making the case that this was an affront on America and our values. Uh, Islam itself was a, was a belligerent religion. And this was something of a victory lap uh, in light of what happened in 9-11. This is like putting a, a flag in a battlefield where you claim territory to have an Islamic center so close to ground zero. So that's how we became familiar with people like Pamela Gallery and Robert Spencer, though they had both been active prior to this time. Since then, they've done all sorts of shenanigans. Uh, they like to sponsor anti-Muslim cartoon contrasts, draw Muhammad cartoons, uh, usually trying to encourage people to draw the most offensive uh, representation of the Prophet Muhammad as they can. Uh, billboard campaigns, and particularly on the East Coast, but also some on the West Coast too. Uh, in subways, like in a New York subway or in a bus system, uh, billboards that have strong anti-Muslim, anti-Islam signs warning America about the dangers of, of Islam and uh, taking over the United States. Uh, 
Claim to fame, infamous claim to fame. Uh, Beller and Spencer were both banned from Britain in 2013 um, by Theresa May, who at the time was the Home Secretary. She, if you've heard her name recently, she's now the Prime Minister of Britain. But they were banned in part because of a concern by uh, Theresa May at the time that uh, their speech would contribute to the public disorder and maybe even to worse. And the, the, their, their presence in Britain was not conducive to public order and peace uh, and, and society and that sort of thing. So they were banned from the, from the UK. Uh, needless to say, they're not happy about it. I'm sure if you ask Mr. Spencer about it on Wednesday, he will give you an earful. Um, I say this in part because uh, Theresa May, who's now the Prime Minister, has been accused of a lot of things but she's never been accused of being a flaming liberal. She's a very conservative politician. This is not something that's driven by liberal politics. This is someone who had strong concerns about uh, what their presence might do. And you have to keep in mind that many European countries regulate freedom of speech a little bit differently and a little bit more than the United States tends to do. So this might seem for many people in America, in America to be an odd move. Uh, but it was still an odd move even in the context of Britain, given who would who the person was behind the ban, which was not someone you would think would be pushing it so far. Spencer, almost everything I just said about Geller is, is, is Spencer's career too, except that he's also the director of a, of a website, a blog called Jihad Watch, and he's also a very prolific author, he's written a lot of books, a couple of them are New York Times bestsellers, um, but he and Geller really are um, a pretty tight-knit uh, pair, and so they do a lot of activities together, they consult with each other very regularly, so a lot of times you hear Geller and Spencer sort of in the same sentence. It's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, but, but his sort of rise to prominence really also happened right around 2010. Prior to 2010, Geller and Spencer really were on the fringe, and, and slowly after 2010 they have become more and more, if not center in terms of their views, at least they've been given a much more of a platform after 2010. That's why we've come to know so much about them. It's very unlikely you would even have heard of these folks 10 years ago at the Gettysburg College been wanting to bring a speaker on to talk about Islam. But now they're, they're, they're common names. The third person I can mention briefly is Frank Gaffney, who is a former Reagan uh, administration official in the Defense Department, was very much on the fringe even back then of the Republican Party. He's always had a, a love-hate relationship with his own party in this regard, and a lot of staff, establishment Republicans have not wanted to have much to do with him over the years. But this has also been sort of the catalyst for him to sort of establish his own reputation uh, sort, of, sort of on the edge of that party. Uh, he created the Center for Security Policy, which is basically an anti-Muslim think tank. It's located just a few blocks from the White House. Uh, more recently, he was very prominent in the birther sort of uh, narrative that President Obama wasn't actually born here in the United States. Gaffney, this was, this was one of his big narratives. And something we'll come back to in a little bit, he is also one of the main proponents behind this notion that an organization called the Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated the United States government at the highest levels and is trying to turn this nation into uh, an Islamic empire of sorts. Uh, the other two I just talked about also sort of buy into this theory, as do many of the people in the Islamophobia industry, but I would say Gaffney is probably its main proponent um, and has really clung to this narrative for a long time. Okay, so those are your main figures. Now, what are some common themes that you would hear if you were to study those three and, frankly, a number of other people in this industry? These are four of many I could have focused on, um, but for the sake of time, I wanted to give you just uh, some snapshots, this is the best I can do tonight, of uh, the kinds of tools that arise from their arsenal that helps to drive and dictate the narrative of Islam that they put out there, that they have had some success in, I should, I should add. We'll start with uh, violent jihad, or frankly just the idea that Islam is inherently violent, um, or at its core is violent. This is a common theme across the Islamophobia industry. Islam is not like other religions. It is unique in this regard. Other religions like Christianity may have had some moments in their history where there was violence, where Spencer would say people wandered away from the true gospel, but it's not at its core violent. Islam, on the other hand, that's a different question, right? And Spencer, Geller, Gaffney, and others would say that this, in fact, is a religion that fundamentally has been about 
violence. So one uh, person who I don't have as much time to talk about tonight, but Ayan Rashia Ali, uh, who's somewhat part of this industry, wrote this a couple years ago in one of her books on, um, on Islam. And she writes, Islamic violence is rooted not in social, economic, or political conditions. It's not even about theology, or theological error at least, but rather in the foundational texts of Islam itself. It's a very common tactic, actually, and a very common pattern in this industry. You talk about Islam as a religion, and you completely isolate it from other social, political, historical, economic factors. So this idea that we can understand religion just sort of on its own, and these other things don't shape it. You notice just how quickly she dismissed all of that. In many ways, she just dismissed a number of disciplines that are taught in this campus in, 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 in one fell swoop. Most of us, if not all of us who study religion and teach on college campuses, I mean, that is an incomprehensible <coughs> statement. An incomprehensible statement. Religion never, never operates in isolation from social, political, economic, historical factors. Uh, that, that is just mind-numbingly mind ignorant, right? But this works. This idea that Islam is its own thing and it's inherently violent. For a lot of people in the United States, they do tend to think of religion in this way, uh, in part because they are not accustomed to studying religion in an academic sense. And so and that raises some other issues we can touch on later. Robert Spencer, he writes, traditional Islam is not itself not, not itself is not moderate or peaceful. It is the only major world religion where they develop doctrine and tradition of warfare against unbelievers. So these huge sweeping statements, just in one sentence, right? He's just summarized all that you need to know about Islam according uh, to Robert Spencer, right? But this idea that it's, that its core uh, is violent. That is a one of the foundational themes and stereotypes and motifs that this, um, this industry uses. Now, uh, I don't have time, as much time as I'd like to sort of deconstruct all of this, but I do want to pause a little bit more on this theme than I will on the others, just to give you a sense of, of how these statements are made almost always without context. The word context does not come to my mind whenever I read Spencer or Hershey Ali or, or Geller or others. The idea that we have to understand Muslims or Islam in, in relation to other sorts of contexts even on questions of violence. If you would read this, and you might draw the conclusion that Muslims in the United States, for example, are a unique source of violence, that we should be particularly afraid of. Now, as a scholar, what should you do? The next question would be, well, what are, this, what are the data? What's the statistics on, on violence in the United States, murders, and that sort of thing? And where does terrorism, <coughs> if that's what they're getting at, fit into this? So, just a few points that a scholar might make. Uh, I'm not sure you're going to hear this from Wednesday, but a scholar might make this point. The FBI, FBI, by the way, not a flaming liberal organization. <laughs> According to the FBI, over a 25-year period, which includes 9-11, this, this includes 9-11, 94% of terrorist attacks carried out in the U.S. soil were carried out by non-Muslims. Okay? So Muslims made up 6% of those attacks. Is it fair to talk about that 6%? Sure it is. Someone like me who studies Islamophobia is not someone saying, therefore, we ignore those things. Context, however, matters. And if I am weighing in on public discourse, and I see a data like this, I might want to start asking questions about what are our policies and strategies in law enforcement or in the government when it comes to that other 94%. Where well, there isn't so much political energy put toward that 94%, right? That's the 6% that has come to dominate. And granted, for some understandable reasons with 9-11, but there is a bigger context here we should pay attention to. In a 2014 survey from the Triangle Center, which is based in North Carolina, and they surveyed 382 law enforcement agencies across the country, and asked them, which community, which group are you most concerned about when it comes to extremist violent behavior? And the majority of them did not list Muslims. They listed right-wing anti-government extremists. Law enforcement agencies, when asked in your jurisdiction, what are you most afraid of? People on the ground who do law enforcement were not listing, in many cases, Muslims. They were list listing these other groups, right? But is their political energy being directed towards a concern about those groups? I would suggest in the United States there's not. Uh, that's easily dismissed by many people, including many people who have been elected to high office. Um, the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point, again, this is the U.S. Military Academy, not a flaming liberal organization. Right-wing extremists in the decade after 9-11 carried out 337 attacks, 254 fatalities. Okay? 
So we're starting to see the picture filled in that when it comes to violent murder or deaths and that sort of thing, that there's much more to this picture and that Muslims themselves don't seem to be the primary source of this violence. Uh, but is that being filtered into this conversation? Is that what you expect to hear on Wednesday? Um, the Triangle Center again, between the end of 2001, so this doesn't include the 9-11 attacks, but it does include the 14 years after. For about 14 years, According to the Triangle Center, 69 people in the United States were killed on U.S. soil by Muslim extremists, or people who self-identified or had a Muslim background. 69 too many. Something we should all take very seriously. Yet in that same period, there were 220,000 murders. In the same period. Is our political energy being directed towards that number in the same way as it is towards the 69? With the understanding, of course, that, yeah, terrorism it has a different kind of connotation when it comes to the kind of murder we're talking about. But still, in terms of the numbers, it's a pretty stark contrast. You could add 9-11 um, fatalities in there, and it would still be a big contrast. In 2015 alone, there were 134 people killed in mass shootings, which is roughly about three or four people more dying at one time in a mass shooting. That's almost twice as many in one year killed in mass shootings, in some cases by people who look like me then were killed in 14 years after 9-11 by Muslim extremists. Is our political energy being directed towards stopping mass shootings? And all I would want you to know or want you to think about as students, as people in academic institutions, why? That why question, right? If our political energy isn't being directed there, what's the payoff? What's the payoff for focusing much more on the 69 over 14 years than the 134 in one year? might be who the perpetrators are. Might be what, what is politically more possible in terms of galvanizing electoral votes and support from the broader population. Okay? Quickly in Europe, I'm just going to give it all to you in one graph, right? Um, what a lot of Americans don't understand, think about Europe, because we've been hearing a lot about terrorist attacks in Europe lately, and we should take those very seriously. There, there is a disturbing trend in the past couple of years. But you might not be as familiar with the broader history of terrorism in modern Europe. And this, go, this is going back to 1970, the counterterrorism uh, database, the global terrorism database at the University of Maryland. So 1970 to 2016. In red are the fatalities at the hands of people who had a Muslim background. Blue, everyone else. If Islam is inherently a source of violence, and Muslims have been very much present in Europe since 1970 and before that, why don't we just have a sea of red? Why not, right? What explains the fact that most of this is not being conducted by Muslims in this 40 plus year history? But that it starts to change, particularly after 9 11. You see the first big one in 2004, that's the Madrid and London, uh, 2004, 2005, the Madrid and London uh, bombings. But you start to see that afterwards, right? This is not about disregarding the stuff that's afterwards, but now we're starting to see some context. So if you ever hear someone say, well, not all terrorists, not all Muslims are terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim, uh, no. That's factually incorrect. It's not my opinion that that's incorrect. That is factually incorrect by a long shot. Our job in an academic institution like this is to take this kind of data seriously, this larger context, and start asking critical questions about what changes these trends. Clearly, if Islam itself is uniquely the source of violence, this graph should look very different than it does. Because Muslims have been coming into Europe in significant numbers since the 1950s and 60s. But it's really primarily after 9-11 that we see that change. These are the kinds of questions that we need to be talking about. We can still talk about Muslims who are engaged in violent extremists, and we should. But we, we should put it in context. My second theme to talk about uh, of the four is another kind of jihad that this group really likes to harp on about. It's called civilizational jihad. And here the idea is that uh, there are Muslims in our midst, a fifth column, maybe something of a Trojan horse, who are now going to start infiltrating in the United States. So this is not about the extremists who, who strap on bombs or grab guns and they try to take people out. These are your next door neighbors. These are your classmates. These are your teachers. Um, if they're really good, these are people who work at the Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security, and they're in our police departments, they're at the State Department, and by God, they might even be in the White House. And they're going to buy their time and ingratiate themselves to the rest of you until the time is right for a full takeover. And this is what is called civilizational 
jihad. It's a very prominent theory um, that has been around actually for, for a little over a decade in a significant uh, sense. Gaffney is one of the main proponents of this. So you see, so pervasive is the MBs. MB is the Muslim Brotherhood. That the idea is that they're the primary organization that has infiltrated. Uh, and you're not supposed to know much about the Muslim Brotherhood for this group. It's, it's long history and much less it's complex, diverse manifestations globally. You're just supposed to know you're supposed to be scared when you hear it. So pervasive is the Muslim Brotherhood, civilization, jihad within the government. And the civil institutions that I serious, sustained rigorous investigation of this phenomenon by Congress for the most part, is in order. And to that end, we need to establish a new and improved counterpart to the Cold War era's HUAC. This is the, the House Un-Americans Committee, which has its origins in the late 1930s when it was, it was dealing with uh, perceived communist infiltration. So Gaffney says, we need to reintroduce that committee, but we're not worried about communist anymore. We're worried about Muslim infiltration. So this is a, 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 a cyclical nature of this history now coming back in terms of Gaffney's way of thinking. Another statement, there are individuals with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood inside or at least influencing the White House, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, Departments of Justice, Defense and Homeland Security, as well as Foggy Bottom. Foggy Bottom is a reference to the State Department, the neighborhood of the State Department located in D.C. So Gaffney is basically saying the highest echelons of the United States government, the people who are running the show, the Muslim Brotherhood has infiltrated and we should be on our guard and we should try to root them out. A very common example of this in the past several years was the idea that Secretary Hillary Clinton's aide, Huma Abedin, was actually a Muslim Brotherhood operative. And that story is everywhere. Um, and that accusation was floated even by a few members of Congress who were buying in to some of these conspiracy theories. So they did stick. These, theory, these conspiracy theories do stick. And, um, and Huma Abedin had, she has a Saudi background at least, but she was perceived for that reason, primarily to be a Muslim Brotherhood operative in the State Department. Another common theme is this idea that there's something called Sharia, which you don't have to really understand because it's really complicated, but they'll sort of zero down on this idea that Sharia really is about cutting off hands and chopping off heads and stoning people. And uh, then there's this idea that that form of Islamic law is steadily starting to encroach upon American life, and eventually there's this, something called creeping Sharia, and before you know it, you're all going to be under Sharia law. Sharia law is they just define it, though. Okay? Um, so Gaffney says, incredibly, this repressive Sharia doctrine is being insinuated into this country not just by Islamists, these are more conservative, uh, a reference to more conservative Muslims who engage in a form of political Islam. They are being aided and abetted by some of the political left. So it's not just Muslims doing this. Anyone who identifies on the left, they're aiding and abetting this process of creeping Sharia by their tolerance. Right? If you're tolerant with Muslims, that's what's going to happen. Or Ben Carson, in his presidential bid, uh, bought heavily into most of these um, motifs I'm talking about from this Islamophobic industry. And in, in fact, he's almost a poster child uh, of a product, at least, of this industry, um, reading the script, in some cases, verbatim. So when asked whether a Muslim should be allowed to become president, Ben Carson during the primary said, I would have problems with someone who embraced all the doctrines associated with Islam of that person becoming president. If they're not willing to direct, reject Sharia and all the portions of it that are talked about in the Quran, if they're not willing to reject that and subject that to American values and the Constitution, then of course I would not or I could not support a Muslim for president. It's not clear that Carson has any idea what Sharia is. <laughs> but he knows it's bad. And he knows this works. And it does work. A lot of Americans, they get this language. It, it, does, it does make them react. Because there are a lot of stereotypes about this. There is very few Americans I have encountered um, who actually know much about Islamic law, and much less the jurisprudence of it. But it, this whole industry preys upon a largely illiterate population that comes to religion. We'll revisit that point later. But this, this industry works in part because it assumes rightly that most people don't know much about Islam or, more broadly speaking, about religion. So there's fertile ground for these narratives to take place and take root. This is a statement from the AFDI. Remember, this is the, the organization co-founded by Geller and Spencer. They don't actually explicitly use the word Sharia, but it's clear this is what they're talking about. And I want you to see this move they're making because there's been some debate I know on this campus about freedom, particularly the freedom of speech. And if, if that concept of freedom is important to you, pause here, okay? AFDI, the American Freedom Defense Initiative, calls for the U.S. and other non-Muslim governments, mostly Europe, 
to recognize officially that Islam is a political movement and not solely religious in the strict sense of the U.S. Constitution. Maybe you can start to see where they're going if you know something about the First Amendment and what it actually contains, right? There's some language in there about religion, right? How do, you, how do you convince a population not to guarantee First Amendment rights and freedom of religion to, an or to a community? You convince them that this is not really a religion, or fully a religion, right? The FBI recognizes that Islam in its mainstream theological formulations and its dominant form throughout its history can and should be regarded as an authoritarian and supremacist political system, as well as a religion, and thus that Muslim groups should be subject to all the scrutiny and legal requirements of political organizations without being able to shield their political activities behind the protection of religious freedom. You want me to translate this for you? The First Amendment does not apply to Muslims, or it should not apply to Muslims, because this is not fully, in the sort of pure sense, religion. This is a political ideology. First Amendment guarantees freedom of religion, not political domination. Very slick move, right? And if you can convince a population that Islam is really not a religion, right? This is not just semantics. This gets to the core of freedoms, right? So as we debate freedoms on this campus this week, I hope this is also part of that debate. Because remember the two co-founders who are behind this statement. One of them is coming to speak on this campus. Does he really believe in constitutional freedoms? Or just constitutional freedoms for certain people? Takia. A decade ago, no one was talking about Takiyah, but my God, I hear this all the time now. Even Muslims are learning about Takiyah. Um, <laughs> and Takiyah, this is, this is also an ingenious move. You know, don't underestimate the folks who put this stuff out there, because they're referring to something real that exists <coughs> in certain communities in Islam. But then they're twisting it and distorting it uh, and turning it into something else that's actually ingenious if, you, if you're on that side of things, I suppose, right? Takiyah is a doctrine really within Shia Islam that's about um, if you find yourself historically in a context in which you're being oppressed or potentially persecuted, you can withhold elements of your religious <coughs> identity or your religious identity altogether if, if it can prevent the persecution, right? Um, this could be persecution or oppression from, uh, you know, in a, in a Christian empire, a European Christian kingdom, or it could be uh, in a context in which Sunni Muslims might have uh, the majority of the upper hand. And, and so, for example, a Shia Muslim might not pray in a certain way that might out them as Shia uh, because uh, a fear of retribution or persecution. That's, in a nutshell, sort of the context of what Takiyah is. Um, but it, it's not like it's a, the central doctrine of Islam, right? Uh, yet it has become this main feature of the anti-Muslim narrative that this industry puts out there. The idea here is that the Kia actually is about Islam commanding or strongly encouraging Muslims to lie so that they can infiltrate and take over. Okay. <clears throat> Pamela Geller, Spencer's uh, partner in crime. Deception, the Kia, lies are essential to advancing Islam according to the Unfortunate Quran. Uh, Spencer, the fact is deceiving non Muslims, deceiving 99% of the population, uh, isn't. Forbidden Islam, in fact, in some circumstances, it may be a religious duty for Muslims to lie to your face every single day. You see what this, what this would encourage you to do here at Gettysburg, right? You have Muslim students, staff, faculty members, you don't trust a word they're saying. You don't trust their good intentions. You don't even trust their good outward actions. They are deceiving you because Islam tells them to deceive you, all right? Or Takiyah, this is Ben Carson, and he got in on the act in the, in the presidential campaign. <laughs> is a component of Sharia that allows and even encourages you to lie to achieve your goals. What's interesting is that this is not the first time in, say, U.S. religious history that you cast a religious minority as particularly prone to deception, and much less in Western history. I mean, the most obvious example is Jews and anti-Semitism. Well, a core feature historically of anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism was the idea that Jews are deceptive, they're shifty, they can't fully be trusted, right? Um, they will lie to you. You had variations of that theory with anti-Catholicism in late 19th and early 20th century America. So it's, it is ingenious in the sense that if you can convince a population they're being commanded by their religion to lie to you, then this is basically in one fell swoop, discrediting everything any Muslim ever says or does, right? And then who are you going to turn to? To get the truth about Islam, well, you won't ever turn to Muslims, which is what this industry wants you to do to begin with. 
They don't want you talking to Muslims. They don't want you engaged in interfaith work. They don't want you building relationships. They don't want you starting to experience different <coughs> perspectives and different voices on Islam and its complexity and its history. They want to control that narrative. How do you control that narrative? You wipe out your competition. It just takes one word. Tahir. Right? This is how this industry works. Okay. So those are the main tools. Now, show me the money, right? <laughs> I promise you that Robert Spencer is not coming here on Wednesday night out of the goodness of his heart. There's money behind this. There's money behind all these figures and the organizations they're connected with. In some cases, there's a lot of money. We have major donors, this is from the Center of American Progress, a couple of reports they've had over the past several years, um, uh, where they've tried to track who's, who's giving money to these organizations. Uh, and here are the top eight funders who tend to fund multiple uh, uh, iterations of these anti-Muslim organizations. <coughs> and then here's some uh, data on the revenue. So according to the Center for American Progress, in the decade or a little more after 9-11, in tracking 10 anti-Islam organizations, you had a total revenue going to the coffers of almost $57 million. That was uh, in the last decade. A more recent study from the Council of American Islamic Relations and UC Berkeley found that in tracking 33 anti-Islam <coughs> organizations between 2008 and 2013, you have almost $206 million. It's not chump change. Not out of the goodness of their hearts. There's money here. There's a lot of money here, and I'm about to say something that's sort of tragic, but uh, if it comes to Islam, if you want to make money, that's the side you go to. You don't go, you don't go to this side. There is no money to be had in doing an undoing career. Not, not like this. Uh, that's where the money is. That's where the money is. If you want just a snapshot of a few organizations, all nonprofits have to uh, fill out an IRS 990. I think some of you probably know that, so this is public information. I didn't, I didn't hire a... a you know, some sort of agent to go behind the scenes and dig this up. But Act for America, a major anti-Islam group, um, Bridget Gabrielle's is president, in 2012 had a total revenue of over a million dollars, and she had a salary just from that organization of over $200,000. I'm not saying that's all the money she earned that year. I'm saying that's the money she got from that organization alone. The David Horowitz Freedom Center, this is, this is also one of these anti-Islam organizations. <coughs> Um, a total revenue of almost $7,100,000. Horowitz is the president. He gets a big salary. What you might need to know about Jihad Watch, which is Robert Spencer's website, is that it is the platform is funded by the David Horowitz Freedom Center. So he draws his salary from that. Not a bad one. Speaking as someone who's a humanities professor at a small town Iowa liberal arts college, I love that salary. That's, this is not where the money is, right? Um, then the American Freedom Defense Initiative almost had a million dollars uh, of revenue in 2013. Geller is the, is the president, so she got a little over $200,000. Uh, that's not all of her income. That's just from that one organization. According to the IRS 990 form, she works for this organization 10 hours a week. Spencer logs in five hours a week for AFDI, uh, and he gets $30,000, which, hey, it's not bad, right, for five hours a week of work. To be fair to Spencer, though, he logs in 60 hours, according to uh, the IRS form for the David Freedom, Horowitz Freedom Center, so he is working hard. I, I got a lot of criticism of the guy, but that he's not working hard is not one of them. He, he, he's, he's awake and churning out stuff left and right, to be sure. But this is just a, a, just a snapshot of some of the money that we're talking about. Now, why are we even talking about these folks? Aside from the obvious thing about Wednesday, but, uh, you know... For him to be invited, there, he has to have been a figure out there at the beginning, and these other figures. And for them to be prominent figures getting that kind of money, those kind of donations, they have to have a receptive audience, and they do. Yeah. You know, I take this group very seriously, very seriously. That they, they have increased their influence the past decade. It's not been going the other way. So how do they do this? What enables this industry to find a receptive audience? There are four factors, I think, that drive much of that uh, receptiveness in the broader population for those who buy into this. First, uh, it has to do with U.S. policy itself, political, foreign policy, what I more broadly will call imperial ambitions. Uh, but there's a long imperial rivalry, if you will, between, uh, going back to the Middle East, between Islamic empires and European Christian empires and kingdoms. Uh, that's actually, for much of that history, Islamic empires have the upper hand. 
But by the 19th century, the fortune shift in European empires have the upper hand, and they're imposing a lot of imperial and colonial rule on most of the majority of countries in that time period. But in the late 20th century, they recede, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union fight out their own superpower duel. But I would call the Soviet Union and the United States in the Cold War still empires of sorts. Uh, Neo-imperialism, even. A projection of political, economic, uh, uh, and military uh, hegemony around the world. And they were fighting a lot of that out ideologically and politically in the Middle East, in the majority of regions. Uh, and even after the fall of the Soviet Union, you still have the United States with a lot of interest in that region of the world, right? Muslims, in other words, have historically for Western nations and regions been obstacles to imperial ambitions. And we're talking about Muslims abroad, of course, but then Muslims at home become symbolic stand-ins for perceived Muslim enemies abroad. And that creates a fertile ground, if you will, in a broader population because of long-standing political interest and investments. Of course, the anxieties and fears fueled by terrorism are important, and that's something to take seriously. 9-11 didn't make a difference. Uh, in Europe, Madrid and London bombings uh, made a difference. Uh, in Paris in November 2015, ma major massacre, made a difference. And yes, this is going to shape public opinion. The Islamophobia industry I'm talking about, they prey on this. That they manipulate that fear and that understandable fear that arises from these events. Third, I told you I was going to return to this. This may be one of my most important points tonight. And this is not meant to insult anyone in this room or my uh, fellow Americans, but we are a religiously illiterate nation. Uh, as Stephen Prothero from Boston University wrote in a book about a decade ago on religious literacy here, the paradox of America is that, compared to Europe, we're a pretty religious country that knows almost nothing about religion, including our own. This is not just we don't know enough about Islam. This is, this is uh, Lutherans not knowing much of anything about Lutherans. And I can speak from some experience because I also teach at a Lutheran college. I, uh, my students will read more Martin Luther in my class on history of Christian thought than they'll have read for 18 years or so coming in the college, right? And, and that's maybe a bigger problem with one of those churches doing that. But, um, but we, need, we need to address this. Spencer, Geller, and others, they hugely depend upon their audiences knowing little to nothing, not only about Islam, but about religion, having no background in the study of religion knowing nothing about its history, right? And then what you'll see, if you go to his talk on Wednesday, is he will be very authoritative. He's, he's going to speak with great authority, great certainty. He's going to throw some Arab-sounding names at you and some, some concepts. He's going to quote from the Quran. Uh, the average person in the audience probably has little familiarity with any of this stuff, right? But it sounds like he'll know what he's talking about. And it will sound like that because many of us just aren't familiar with Islam. But even when he makes comparisons to Judaism or Christianity, many of us are not familiar with these traditions in their history either, or their text. And so either way, it, it, what, he's, what he's doing it makes it sound like he really knows what he's talking about. And he speaks with such, such certainty. And here we are in the year 2017, we're still a fairly uncertain nation in many ways when it comes to how to make sense of religion, where religion fits into our religious and cultural and political landscape, and they pray on it. They pray on it. Finally, the lack of relationships between Muslims and the non-Muslim majority. According to, a, I think it's a Pew study from a few years ago, 63% uh, of Americans do not personally know Muslims. It's about two-thirds of the country. They don't think they know Muslims. Actually, a much more complicated question that sounds like part of Americans. But, um, but two-thirds of the country don't think they know Muslims, right? But personal relationships really do matter. They're one of the most significant uh, ways to counter prejudice by not just building relationships, but building deep friendships. When you have a deep friendship with someone of a different religious tradition, you're much more likely to have a positive view of that religion. And there are many studies that bear this out, not just a few studies. If I know someone who's Catholic, I'm much less likely to be anti-Catholic. If I know someone who's Jewish, I'm much less likely to be anti-Semitic. And, and by knowing, I mean having a real friendship, right? And if I know someone who's Muslim, I'm much less likely to be Islamophobic. I'm able to contextualize what I hear in the news, or what I see in the media, or in Hollywood movies, portrayals of Muslims, or what I hear on Wednesday night. If I have a, a deep personal relationship with someone who's Muslim, and I'm starting to think, this does not resonate with my experience of who I know. And I, I trust who I know more than one person I hear from one out. But when two-thirds of the country don't know a Muslim, right, you see, you see the opening here for people like this. This is why interfaith relationships, as difficult as they are, to create. And I know interfaith work is messy. It's hard. And it's time consuming. But this is where the needle moves. 
we can work on religious literacy, but that's a much harder problem, I think. I think the personal relationships is where we're going to see the most traction and the most capacity to push back on these kinds of narratives. What is the impact, finally, of professional Islamophobia? Um, I'm not going to suggest that this industry is directly responsible for everything I'm about to talk about, but they contribute to the atmosphere that leads to the stuff. So in my opinion, yes, they are a part of the problem. Hate crimes, anti-Muslim hate crimes, according to the FBI, which we did rule is not, according to the FBI, five times higher on average since 9-11 than before. With a big spike, of course, uh, in the four months after 9-11. That's where you see it going almost up to 500. But you see it comes down, but it never gets down to the 2000 level. And it has not since then. <laughs> so five times higher per year on average is the new norm after 9-11, anti-Muslim hate crimes. Or hate crimes targeting people perceived to be Muslim. Because sometimes people commit these crimes and they think it's a Muslim they're targeting them. It could be someone who's Arab but secular. It could be a Sikh or others, right? Uh, you also see a big spike in 2015. It's the biggest spike we've had since 9-11. According to the FBI, from 2014 to 2015, a 67% increase in anti-Muslim hate crimes. You need to know this as a community in line with what's happening this week. If you want to know why some people might be anxious about the speaker coming on Wednesday, it's not all reduced to the First Amendment freedom of speech. There are other factors at work that you may not know about. And this, this is serious stuff. If you want to take freedom of speech seriously, do it. Take this seriously too. Freedom of speech is not a trump card to ignore hate crimes. Or at least I hope it's not. It's not in my book either. But hate crimes, this, this could be uh, physical assaults, this could be ripping a hijab off of someone, this could be vandalism of mosques, desecration of mosques or cemeteries. Um, as I said earlier, hate crimes can target people who are Muslim or mistaken as Muslim, such as Sikhs. The first post-9-11 retaliatory murder was not of a Muslim, but of a Sikh man in, um, in Arizona. Uh, or that you, you don't remember from a few years ago in Milwaukee at a Sikh temple, there was a mass shooting there. Uh, by Wade Michael Page, and is almost certain that he thought he was opening fire on Muslims. Uh, in fact, he was opening fire on six. Interesting thing about hate crimes, you can also have an Islamophobic driven hate crime spree that consciously targets people who are not Muslim. The best example of this is Anders Breivik in Norway in 2011. To someone who was deeply hateful and fearful of Muslims was <coughs> really upset that Norway had been letting in Muslim immigrants, refugees. He, he faulted the Labour Party for this. The Labour Party was the ruling party at the time. And he decides to go to war on this. So he goes out in July of 2011 and then he bombs a building, a government building in Oslo, and then he goes to an island outside of Oslo called Atoya, uh, where uh, a Labour Party youth camp was taking place and he murders mostly youth and children. He knows who he's killing. He's killing people he thinks are representative of the government. And the government is the source behind the Muslims taking over Norway and Europe from within. So 77 people die in this. This is just an example of the breadth of an Islamophobic hate crime. No one is safe. No one is safe, right? Interesting thing about this, a little, little uh, 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 trivia here. He wrote a uh, manifesto, which I think you can still read online. It's not fun reading, it's very long, uh, rambling, but uh, he quotes all these people we're talking about from the professional Islamophobia network. His favorite, Robert Spencer. Robert Spencer, who either he cites Spencer or cites Jihad Watch the website. Some of those articles aren't written by Spencer, but over 160 times. Uh, much more than even Geller or Gaffney or others. He loves Robert Spencer. Does that mean Robert Spencer is responsible for this? That's not my point. But this is the kind of guy who resonates with Robert Spencer. All right, the, the, this is the kind of guy we're talking about, who, who buys into that, that sort of narrative. What else have we seen? We've seen armed hate rallies. This is a picture from Phoenix, Arizona in May of 2015. I don't know many Lutherans or Presbyterians or Episcopalians who, when they go to church on a Sunday, they have to <coughs> wander through uh, people wearing military fatigues and carrying guns, trying to intimidate them. But there have been some occasions in the past couple of years where Muslims have had to do this. Um, is that fair? Is that something we're willing to fight against? Is, as much as we're willing to fight for freedom of speech, are we also willing to fight against this with the same vigor? Mosques, 
I mentioned the 2010 uh, uh, New York City controversy. After that, in the two years after that, there's a 345% increase in opposition to Musk. And remember, Geller and Spencer were behind that New York City controversy. So it really was a catalyst for a lot of oppositions and local communities pushing back on the building of mosques across the country. First Amendment be damned. Freedom of uh, religion be damned. All right? And so 345% increase. 2015 also saw a huge uptick in, in either opposition to the building of mosques or vandalism or desecration of mosques. So 2015 was bad in many ways, as I said earlier. Um, that's that's sort of what we're coming out of as we have debates like you're having this week here on campus. Um, Anti-Islam legislation. This is just a map of states in red that have passed some sort of bill that targets Muslims, mostly anti-Sharia bills. They're easy to pass. Um, there's actually no threat of, of something called Sharia taking over places like Oklahoma anyway, but it, 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 it works politically. It works politically. Uh, if, if, you, if you get yourself in that mindset and you sort of let go of some of your ethical convictions, you can understand why you would try to create anti-Islam legislation. That they're just not a popular community in any of these states and uh, increasingly in the country. Ten states have enacted some sort of legislation against Muslims, most of them anti-Sharia. And from 2013-2015, over 80 bills or amendments introduced targeting Muslims, uh, or Islam, or Sharia. And this could even include things like teaching about Islam in public schools and, and social studies classes. Uh, imagine trying to teach a world history course, <coughs> course on the Middle East, but we can't talk about Islam. That's the kind of stuff we're starting to deal with now, and some of this legislation, at least as being pitched out there, could make things uh, harder. Um, if you just jump down a little bit, uh, from the public policy polling in uh, 2015, so this is in the run-up to the primaries in Iowa, where I teach, 30% uh, of GOP voters agree that Islam should be illegal. The good news is that 70% were, were not in favor of that, right? So that, and that is a good thing. But it still should give one pause in this, and give you a, a sense of the atmosphere we're working with right now, that you have a third of GOP uh, voters in Iowa thinking that this religion should be banned. And then 40% of people who self-identify as conservative, this could transcend parties, in North Carolina around the same time saying the same thing. That, that is enough to give concern and pause. I, I, I could go on and on about these other things that we've had since 9-11 that have targeted Muslims. We've had a registration program already called NSEERS um, that targeted non-immigrant Muslim men for the most part. We've had surveillance and profiling. The NYPD had a very infamous surveillance unit where they were infiltrating mosques and had mosque crawlers and, and people trying to get the goods on Muslims in, in the New York uh, state re region. Um, uh, it was shut down because it wasn't producing any convictions. Uh, surprising racial and religious profiling doesn't work. Uh, but, but it's slow going in some of these instances, right? Detentions and deportations, torture and the war on terror. I assure you that the people being tortured in the war on terror were not people who looked like me. They weren't white Midwestern Lutherans or Presbyterians or anything like that. They were Muslims and Arabs and people perceived to be Muslim and Arab. And I don't think that's an accident either. Um, it's acceptable in many ways to target people like this. So this is what we're dealing with when we're talking about this industry and the kind of influence and impact it can have. And on that note, I just want to open it up for conversation, questions, and whatever you got, you know, let me have it, right? But let's have an honest, open sort of uh, uh, discussion tonight about this topic.